I am, I'm very glad that this all worked out. Because <laughs> originally I was supposed to go on Tuesday, didn't work out, I was a little bummed, but here we are today. So thank you so much for being here. Um, this talk is entitled Don't Touch That, and I assume you've probably read the abstract, and that's awesome if you did. So I want to set a couple of quick expectations about what I'm going to be going over, given the amount of time that I have, which is only 30 minutes as of now. And that is, is that I can't go super, super deep into just about anything. My goal here is simple. My goal is to help us all get ourselves in a different state of mind and to remember one very fundamental thing, which is we have a great opportunity to have a lot of fun doing what we do that goes well beyond writing features. And because of that, especially for those of you who are very new to this entire ecosystem, first and foremost, welcome. Welcome to you. I want you to know that even though I and many others around you may have been doing this for a while, you are as welcome as anyone else that's here for one very fundamental reason. Not a single one of us in this entire room were born with the ability to write code. So each and every one of us started at, the, at a similar spot where we knew nothing. And so you are just at a part of that journey where others are in a different spot in their journey. So to that, I want to say welcome to you. But again, this talk is entitled Don't Touch That. Now, raise your hand if you've ever started writing a Rails app from the beginning. Right? Rails new, right? And this is kind of how the story goes, right? We go to the generator and we download the thingy-majigs, and then, then you put in the Rails new wording, and it, you know, you, you say that all the things that you wanted the stuff, and you say, I'm gonna do my super to-do-y awesome application. You press the magic enter button and a whole lot of craziness happens. It starts to spit stuff out left, right, and center. I created 44, 85, 90 files. I can control this, that, and the other thing, left, right, and center. And before you know it, you have an application. That's right. But does it ever feel like, uh, does it ever feel like this? Just a touch? Right, you're like, great, I'm a software developer, yet I still know not a damn thing. Right? A little bit of that feeling, totally. And that's the thing, is that Rails is gorgeous and beautiful and magical. And for those of you who have never done anything with Rails before, it might feel a little bit like this is kind of what's going on under the hood. <laughs> right? We got about 95% magic, few sparkles, you know, hopes and dreams, and mother's milk. Right? This is kind of how Rails sort of makes things feel at times. It's a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's magical because it empowers us to do incredible things very, very rapidly. And on the other hand, there's a lot hidden under the scene. And for some of us, that magic can be very intimidating. I want to give huge credit to Eileen Uchatel, who gave the, the keynote yesterday, um, for many reasons, one of which is that she pounded a drum very loudly that I hope all of us that were there and those of you who were not get a chance to see. And that was simply that we are all the arbiters of the future of Rails. We are all the ones, regardless of our experience level, that can help create positive change in that way and in our community. So in my opinion, and what I totally agree with, is that it's really important that we kind of demystify the idea that Rails is just magic. And I know that we all know that. We're all highly logical people, of course. We all know that you know, Rails is, there's actual code and, you know, uh, Aaron Patterson, or Tender Love, you know, he gave this fantastic talk, as he normally does, talking about some of the, what makes the magic possible. Raise your hand if you were lost. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, me too. Every, time. Every single time. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm like, okay, different level of, uh, different level of intellect, we'll say. I don't know, right? But bottom line is, is that it is all of us that create the change that we hope to see in this way. Now, I want to normalize the playing field a little bit here because I have a belief that some of us may not know each other. Am I right? Ah, I knew I was. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up if uh, you have a sibling. Stand up if you have a sibling. OK, look around the room. Now you yeah, see, one of a kind, right? OK, go ahead and take a seat. I want you to now stand up if you are older than one of your siblings. If you're the older of the two. Stay standing if you are the oldest. 
All right, look around. See each other? See each other? Okay, very good. Very, very, very good. Okay, great. All right, now go ahead and take a seat. I want you to stand up if you're left-handed. Okay, look around the room. But only point with your left hand, of course. <laughs> okay, let's flip-flop it. Stand up if you're right-handed. Sit down, unless you are ambidextrous. <laughs> sorry, sorry, it was some Ruby language there. <laughs> unless not if true. <laughs> unless not if true, left hand, right hand, if you meet in the middle. Stand up, not sit down, stand to it. I don't know why that was confusing. I want you to stand up if you were born in a South American country. Okay, take a seat. I want you to stand up if you were born in a European country. Take a seat. If you were born in an African country. Okay. Very good. Now. I want you to stand up if you have been writing code professionally, as in someone somewhere has paid you a dollar or more for more than a year. Awesome. Take a seat. If you are less than a year. And welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. Go ahead and take a seat. All right. The bottom line is, is that we all share some level of commonality with one another, and that's a fantastic thing, and we should never, ever forget that. If you ever feel alone in this community, just know that while it might feel that way, there's a very good chance that it is not true. And so I want to be the one that helps you understand that as well. There's always something we can find in common, one way or the other. Even if it isn't traits, it can come down to the things we feel, believe, and value. Okay. Now, here's the thing about being a child. And that is, is that as a child, and I am now a parent of a one-year-old and an almost four-year-old, is that kids think a little differently about the world, kind of, and I'll get into that here in a minute. But more than anything, what I'm amazed by is they don't come to the table with many presumptions about the world in general, right? Now, I found it fascinating because I did a little bit of research of like, like what's the intellectual differences between kids and adults? Because for those of you who are parents, and I should probably do this as a stand-up if, but it's probably a depressing moment. Um, if you're a parent, well, why not? Let's do it, right? If you're a parent and have felt less intelligent than your under five-year-old, please stand up. <laughs> Absolutely. You are the smartest people in the room, and your less than five-year-old is reminding you you're an idiot. I feel this every day, okay? But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to challenge you with a couple of problems that have been shown that, in fact, kids solve faster than adults. Now, if you have, if what I'm about to show you, if you know the answer to it, don't blurt it out. You can nod silently to yourself. I'm going to give you a few seconds to figure it out, but just know that all of the problems I'm about to show you, the average adult takes multiple minutes to solve. All right? So it's OK if you don't know the answer because statistics show that you are probably more commonly not going to know than you might, OK? But here you go. The first one is this. What number is the car parked in? I said don't blurt it out, <laughs> except you didn't. Work it. I'll give you another 10 seconds. If you think you know the answer, just put your right hand up. And it's, again, it's OK if you don't. All right. I'm going to help you out just a little bit. Actually, for those of you who do feel like you don't know the answer, do not know the answer, unless if not, then true. Uh, take a guess if you do not know. You're just guessing. Somebody throw one out. 80, 80. OK. What else? Another guess. 78, another guess. OK, I'm going to help you out here a little bit. What if I was to do this? <laughs> Interesting, right? What number is it? Totally, 87. All right, I've got a little bit harder problem for you, OK? Now, real quick, just a quick show of uh, hands, as in don't raise it. No, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, raise your hand if you did know the answer. Now look around, because again, I said it before, it's okay that you don't, and it has no bearing on your intellect whatsoever. Majority of us will not know it in time. That's okay. All right, here's the next one, and I'm gonna give you a little bit more time. This is the pattern I want you to match. Now here's the thing, and this is gonna get embarrassing. Most kids solve this in under 10 seconds. Most, and I'm, I'm not kidding, this is how it's labeled, programmers take hours. <laughs> okay? If you think you know how this works, put your right hand up. If you think you know how this works. Because what I'm about to do is give you four random numbers and ask you what the answer is. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about this problem right here is there's a lot more information on the screen than you ever need to know to solve the problem. In fact, I'm going to start to remove items and tell you that you can absolutely determine the answer without ever seeing the items get removed. You can totally determine the answer without the items getting removed. I'm going to leave these two on the screen a second. And now raise your hand if you can figure out how it works. Somebody with their hand up, yell out, why is the top one four? The second one, why is it a zero? There's no circles. So, what is 7662? Two. two. Raise your hand if you feel a little stupid. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Now here, again, why do kids solve this faster than seasoned programmers often do? They're not looking for numbers. What happens is kids, because they don't have a lot to presume, they come to the problem with a different set of assumptions. They come with assumptions, they come with a different set. So, what's the answer to this one? Same problem. Six, eight is three, nine is another four, five, six, and seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven zeros, seven holes, sorry. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Good call. It's my dyslexia. Okay, last one for you. Okay? With one line, I want you to make that a six. If you know the answer, raise your hand. With one line, I want you to make it a six. When you know the answer, raise your hand. Okay? Now, I found this problem because there was somebody on a street, a street performer that was offering $50,000 if you could figure it out. You ready? Anyone think of that? <laughs> we just see it differently, friends. I was at OMSI yesterday, and this is my oldest daughter, Charlie. At OMSI, which is the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, which is not, I mean, you could walk to it from here. Uh, it was really interesting because this here is actually a kid's area. And in this area, uh, they're learning about how uh, pulleys work. Now, I want, you to, I want you to look real close at what she's doing right now. What is she not doing? It correctly. <laughs> and this is an important thing to remember about children is that they're not precious about their past history around things. They're precious about stuff, don't get me wrong, but it's very different for us as adults. So one of the first things we have to do in any area is that we have to kind of break down our preconceptions about how something's meant to work. And as a result of that, you can find new possible solutions. This is one of the joys of being a parent or an aunt, an uncle, where you can observe small kids, is that you can enjoy watching them figure things out over time. 
Now these three, three little monsters are not all my own. Mine is in the center. Um, family friends of ours, in fact, Chelsea is somewhere in the audience. The one on the, out and, uh, the outsides are, hi, are her uh, son and daughter. Um, but what I have loved watching in them growing up and what brought me to the point of wanting to give this talk in the first place is the reminder that you can just love life if you choose to. And you can problem solve by trying more than anything else. And here's the thing about Ruby and Rails in particular is unlike Dorothy's magic slippers, it's just code. All the magic that's happening under the hood, 100% of it, is done with over 90%, over 95% just Ruby code. So the real question is not what's the magic, but how does the magic materialize itself, right? So with a handful of minutes, I'm going to give a go at a couple of strategies that you can use and put into practice today to explore a little bit break some things. Now, if you, were, uh, if you were at Eileen's talk yesterday, she talked about don't monkey patch stuff, right? Now, for those of you, raise your hand if you're not familiar with what that term means. Okay, so basically what it means in my summary, my version of it is effectively Ruby has this really powerful opportunity that, of it, that gives itself to us as developers, which is even if a class or a method or even a variable is defined, we can redefine it on the fly. So what that means is, is that you can reopen string, like the actual string class, and you can redefine how it works on the fly and overwrite effectively the kind of core functionality of a thing. It's kind of dangerous, as you can kind of imagine, right? It's kind of like saying that I'm going to replace your spatula with a, a, a knife, right? And just kind of hope the two still work together. But that's why that's being brought up. But I'm going to show you how we might do some of this. And very specifically, this is what I'm going to show you to do. And let's hope the live coding gods are on my side, shall we? All right. Yes. There's a good chance I'll spell things wrong and screw it all up. But we're here together, right? OK. So. The first thing that we're going to do is come over to here. And what we have going here is we have a basic Rails application. All right? So we've got our basic you know, to do softly Rails application. This is wired up with basically Rails new. Now, what ends up happening is Rails just Can you make it bigger? Certainly. <laughs> certainly, I can. Uh, let's do that. And that, better, more, just, let's just, just, we're going to look at that, look at that. Yes, large text. Okay. So we've got a basic Rails application. Now here's one of the things that's kind of magical but kind of unfortunate, which is Rails, like most libraries in your code, are going to load in a way silently, meaning that if you look at your application logs by default, not a lot of the underlying stuff is going to be written into it, which is sort of problematic if you're trying to figure out how do things work. But I'm going to show you how you can dive in and figure that stuff out. So let's say as an example, we have our Rails application, and we're just going to do Rails server to boot it up. Let's hope this is going to work. Mm -hmm. OK. And then we go over to our application, and this is just the default. Uh, default um, page. Now, if we go to to do's, which I loaded, I already ran a scaffold generator for this. We just have the basic Rails scaffold. Now, part of the magic that's often that I often hear from, especially newer folk, is like, how does it know when to pluralize something or singularize things? And I'll show you where you can figure some of that stuff out. But the bottom line is, this is kind of the fun stuff to play with. But we have our to do's application. Very simple, and we're going to create just a couple of basic to-dos, which is uh, create the talk. All right, we'll create our first to-do. Okay, go back to our to-dos, and we'll just create one more because why not? Um, give the talk. Yeah. Okay, so we have our sets of to-dos. Now, what happens if we go back to our open up our code in our application? And inside of our to-do partial that's actually displaying the text on the screen in that show state, we look over here and we're like, oh, there's this little title field. And what we want to do is we want to just you know, upcase the whole thing. 
Well, Rails is kind of cool like that because you can just kind of say upcase, right? Then if we roll back to our stuff, and it's just magic, right? All these fun little methods. But maybe you kind of ask yourself, like, well, wait a second. Like, I, what if I want to do more with this little method or know how this little method works? Well, what you could start with is you could just go to GitHub and, you know, take a look at the code if you want to. Or you can F with things. Okay. That's exactly what you're going to try and do. All right. So if we... Oh, whoops. I'll talk about that here in a second. So we're, you may or may not be familiar, but this is a really good starting spot of all of the, it, these aren't the guides, but this is basically the API of Rails. And you might notice that there's a whole lot of methods in here that do a whole lot of various things. And again, if you open up any of these, you're probably, you may or may not be familiar with this. It's going to give you some examples of what the methods can do, which is fun. But let's say we want to, like, break them. How might we do that? So the first thing I want to talk you through is actually how to load the gem, a custom version of the gem, into your application. And so even though Rails, by default, is not something you can contribute to directly, in other words, I can't push that up to GitHub and break the world's applications, instead what I can do is I can actually fork that or just simply clone that repository, load that version locally into my application, and screw with that code. It won't affect anything outside of it, okay? So here's how we go about doing that. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our gem file. Now, the gem file, as you probably are familiar, has all of those external Ruby dependencies that you're going to load into your application, including in which, looking at line 7, is Rails. Now, to keep myself from a whole lot of uh, um, whoopsies and oopsies, I actually already included this line here. But this line would not normally be there. Okay, so just imagine for a minute that you added it. But the first thing that we can do is we can actually load in a custom copy of the code. Now, where did that code come from in this path, this local path? This is what you ran when you ran git clone of the Rails repo. So in my example, I have a directory called code, and then I have another subdirectory called source, and inside of the source directory, I git cloned the actual Rails repo from GitHub. That's where that came from. So this is where the code lives. Now, this is maybe a part where things can get a little confusing, because for some people, they confuse, well, where did the gems load that my application is going to use by default against where did I clone the code? Those are two different spots. This version here is where I cloned the code into my computer, wherever that happens to be. OK, so I've added this, which means that I'm going to have to update my bundle. OK, so we'll go here. We'll stop our server. Bundle update. And we're going to run into our first problem. First problem is, well, the version of the code I cloned is effectively the edge version. Right? It's sitting on the main branch in the default branch, not the version of the release. They're two different spots. So how do I set my local version to that so that I can be running effectively a similar version of code that is the gem as it would be locally on my computer? Okay, so it's a quick fix. All right, and it actually involves that we're going to open up the code itself um, onto our computer. So. Hold on, I know, I'll make it bigger. Okay, we'll go like that. Okay, so just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back one directory, and you can see that these are all the various, you know, repositories that I've cloned from GitHub. Okay, and you'll notice that the third one down is Rails. So, oh, that's not going to work like I hoped. Nope. Um, So one of the great things that they do inside of the Rails, the Rails code base is they tag the releases. So a git tag is effectively a marker that says this specific commit represents the state of code at this point in time. And uh, the core team has done a phenomenal job of making sure that the releases are, are well tagged. So here's how we look at them. So this here is not my application code. This is the source code of the Rails gem I downloaded. And if I run git tag, it's going to give me all of those tags. So I can just look down and see, or I think I'm moving the wrong, no, I'm not moving the wrong direction. 
and go all the way. There's a lot of them here. And we'll go all the way to the end. And sure enough, there's a tag here at the bottom that represents that version of the release that I want to play with. Okay, so first step is we got to make sure that our code base, our local version, is actually the same spot. This is get to the rescue. Okay, so first one. We're going to check out, tag, I think it's tags, v7.0.3. We're going to create a new branch that is playtime version 7.0.3. Is it going to work? Oh, of course it does. Because <laughs> I already did this gloriously. Not magic. It would normally do other things. Um, actually, well, actually, we'll, we'll just kill it off. Uh, just so you can see it. I want to make sure we're clear. Uh, play v 7.0.3. Okay. All right. So then we'll run that same code again. Okay. So now we have a new branch at that specific release point. Okay. Good. So when we open up our code into our editor, not our application code, but specifically the Rails code, this is, whoa, too far. This is the Rails code at this point. But this is where we can start to really screw up some stuff. Let's do it, shall we? So let's just pick, uh, we're, gonna just, we're gonna pick a random method. And if you're new to this, here's a couple of things you could do to figure some stuff out. This is something that actually happens very rarely. First is everything in green are all the comments. And the Rails core team does a fantastic job with this. So first thing is to read that. What I love to do and when I was learning stuff is I would read through some of this documentation and figure out, well, not what's missing. I wasn't trying to fix stuff. I was just trying to break it and see, see what it took to break things to make it not work anymore. So in this case, like let's look at the method pluralize on line 32 between line 32 and 34. And up above it, the comments are telling us examples of what you could do and how you could do it to make it work differently. All right? So in this example, let's just Let's just do a couple of simple things, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to raise um, hell. OK? Then we're going to go back to our application code this time. We're not doing anything with the, the Rails repository other than making some changes. Oh, I didn't, I didn't run this command, so let's hope for the best, shall we? See what happens. Oh, look, an error. I wonder what it says. <coughs> uh, we'll scroll all the way to the top over a little error. Want to see it? Oh, it's catching the air, isn't it? instead. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try it. It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter, though. The air is probably, I, I'm pretty certain the air is actually getting, it's getting swallowed. Um, but what I want to point out is this. So if we look through this, what's ultimately getting spit out here? Anyone? The stack trace. Okay, so the stack trace in this instance is going to give us every, inst every example of what it took to get from point A to point B, point B being the point in which a failure occurred. This is what I started to dig through and what I recommend you dig through to find spots and figure out what does what and when. This, to me, is one of the best parts to figure out how Rails works in the first place, is just simply to dig through the stack trace. Every line on here represents a very specific file. Now, in most of these, you're going to notice that you see, I don't know my pointer, where did my pointer go? Uh, my pointer? OK. Remember I was talking about a difference between the gem location and our local location? See that right here? So right there is where the gems are located, OK? See if we can find where our bundle is located. I don't know if I'm seeing anything. Let's try a different error. Let's try a different break. Nope. Oh, there, we'll get this running again. 
Nope. Not that. <laughs> what am I missing? Oh, look, live coding guides. How you doing? What's up? Okay, um, I don't know, <laughs> but we'll move on for a second. So what effectively is going to happen at this point is simply that we're load maybe not simply, but that we're loading the Rails code itself from the gem that we downloaded directly into our application. I'm running out of time, and so that's kind of problematic, because I don't know how to debug this in line as we're talking about this right now. But for all of you who are trying to do this from the beginning, the first step is going to be to re read some of this documentation. You can load any Ruby gem that's publicly available directly into your application this same way. If you go back to your gem file, you can load a direct path to any of those spots. You can edit that same code, and when it breaks, you can figure out where. This is also one of the really helpful ways if you are having to be on an airplane working on some code. Right? I've done this before. So with that, so I have a handful of minutes remaining. I'm going to wrap up. And I'm sorry that we got cut short a little bit. So the first thing I want to really lean into is this idea that we say to ourselves, I don't know. And what happens when we don't know? There's, a, there's kind of a subtle shift to that question I want to encourage you to think about, which is, Asking yourself, and if I did know, what would that mean? What would I start to think if that was true? How might I look differently at the problem? See, as a parent, I've noticed that my kids don't ask the first question all that often. They make believe around this one pretty quickly. They start to assume that maybe there's a different way to think about the problem, because it might not even be a problem in their eyes. And I think this is a really important thing for us to remember. If you're interested in the notes from this, because there are more, I'm happy to send them to you. You can find me on the Slack, and you can include it there. I didn't go over who I am. So, but before I do, I want to hit on this one thing, and I want to go back to, I want you to stand up if you've ever felt like you are stuck in the middle. What I mean by that is that you feel that you're kind of just lost without direction as a programmer. Stand up if you've ever felt lost without, a dir without direction as a programmer. Totally. This is an incredibly common feeling. Look at each other. The idea of being stuck in the middle is very, very real. Now, there's a talk that's happening. You can go ahead and take a seat. There's a talk happening later on this afternoon by Chelsea that's talking specifically about how we can help one another get unstuck, effectively. That's my words. A lot of it comes down to how we can help mentor and support one another through these challenges. I believe things like pair programming are incredibly powerful. Accepting that things aren't going to work like you hoped, pretty powerful. There's some other things I want to I look at. If you feel or identify as someone that's junior or mid-level, or if you're a member of a team where you're bringing in folks that are more junior and mid-level, and it's this thing right here that's written across my chest, and it's called the software residency. If you're interested, I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. The software residency is a program that we started. And the program is designed specifically, and you can fill out this form if you're interested, for folks that just need mentorship more than anything else. So if your organization is one where you're trying to diversify the skill levels of your team, even the demographics of your team for that matter, this might be something that I'd be really curious to get your feedback on or thoughts about. If you are somebody who feels stuck in the middle, you feel junior or mid-level, trying to make your way down this career path to more senior or lead-level work. This program is designed specifically for that. I'm not encouraging you to leave your jobs, none of the above, 
But this is a hiring, recruiting, training, and onboarding process that we institute for other companies. And again, the stuff that we're talking about here is a lot of the stuff that you just end up learning and kind of stumbling across as you're going through the process of figuring that out. Now to what my name is. My name is Adam Cuppy. You probably read at least that part. I spent a lot of time as a developer. I spent a lot of time as an actor. And what I realized as both was that our way in which we problem solve and the way in which we deal with challenges differs between each and every one of us, but the common, there's one common thread, and that common thread is more often than not, it's the help of someone else that gets us over the hurdle. <clears throat> What's challenging is that for many of us who might identify as introverts, I don't, it can be really hard. It can be really hard to ask for help. It can be really hard to feel alone. It can feel really hard in a lot of ways. And while this is one solution to the problem, I want to encourage you to think about all the other solutions, and I want to call out one more. This is actually a product that I think is fantastic. I have no association to it whatsoever. I just think it's wonderful. It's called Jumpstart Pro. Jumpstart is a template for Rails applications. You don't need to use it at your company. But here's why I think it's magical, is because what Chris Oliver has done, who runs GoRails, is that he's integrated a whole lot of learning into setting up an application. So if you want to get past the magic in it all and just understand some of the mechanics, Go Rails, Chris Oliver, and Jumpstart Pro as a template is phenomenal. I think it's really, really well done. Okay? I want to thank you for your time. If you have questions, find me on Slack. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Be a kid. Cool? All right. Have a good day. Oh.